the Vineyard Haven Public Library. We've been commemorating the sesquicentennial of the American Civil War through our discussion series, Let's Talk About It, Making Sense of the American Civil War. In addition to our five discussion sessions, we have had and will continue to have many ancillary programs. These programs are brought to you by the Let's Talk About It grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the American Library Association. Our next event will be a presentation by John Huff, Jr. of his book, Seen the, Seen the Glory, a novel of the Battle of Gettysburg. And this is a sort of a local book in that um, he tells the story of Luke and Thomas Chandler, who grew up on Martha's Vineyard, raised by their abolitionist father, and Rose, their headstrong and beautiful Cape Verdean housekeeper. When a recruiter comes to the island, the boys, who have already witnessed their father and Rose helping a runaway slave to freedom and who are determined to join the fight against slavery, eagerly en enlist in the um, storied 20th Massachusetts Voluntary Infantry. And now an evening of Civil War era poetry by the Martha's Vineyard Poetry Society. Good evening, my name is William Waterway, and thank you for coming to an evening of Civil War poetry hosted by the Vineyard Haven Library. Thank you for applying for that grant, Betty, and congratulations on your success. I know it's very competitive, and it's a national campaign on this Civil War library presentation, and uh, also, too, I want to give thanks to uh, Daniel Adams, who is videotaping this this evening. And before we begin, uh, we have an announcement by Ellie Bates relative to the Martha's Vineyard Museum and their participation in this event tonight. And we do have some handouts here from the museum and the Martha's Vineyard Poetry Society. So Ellie Bates, Ellie, come on up and say a few words. from um, your affectionate son, Charlie Mack, which is the diaries and letters of um, Charles um, uh, McGrady Vincent, who is one of our local boys who did fight in the Civil War. Um, and that's available at the um, bookstore, our little museum store at the, um, the in, in Edgartown, also here um, for your own reading and enjoyment, uh, and there's also excerpts of his diary in this uh, little uh, newspaper that was published by the Gazette in cooperation with, um, you know, the Martha's Vineyard Museum. Uh, also, if you are at all available on Saturdays, um, come on down because the Civil War exhibit is on until April 21st, and um, Islanders are free, or donation, so, um, you know, you can see it uh, there, and you can see a lot of uh, Charlie's, his original diary, and um, some of the artifacts that go with his, um, his story. Uh, I think upstairs are copies of The Messenger, which is our um, newsletter to the public, or, well, to, to actually our members, but the next event um, that we're featuring is Tuesday, April 3rd, which is a Civil War lecture on the Battle of Hampton Roads, uh, the USS Monitor, and the CSS Virginia, and we have an expert coming to talk about that. Uh, it is um, 5.30 at the, the, the library, which is another building on the museum campus. Um, anyway, I'm really proud to be part of this organization, <laughs> Vineyard Haven uh, Library, and all libraries on the island, uh, as well as um, you know the museum, which has been a second home to me. So anyway, um, I will leave my readings up here. And when it's my turn, you'll hear from me again. And I'll also But uh, in our, our events, so welcome. Monday, oh, I should say that Monday through, um, through, through Saturday, 10 to 4. 
Thank you, Ellie Bates. The Martha's Vineyard Poet Society, besides being involved with producing events such as this, uh, we've been producing a lot of events over the past year. We are in process of now electing our island's first Martha's Vineyard Poet Laureate in the history of Martha's Vineyard. Uh, we have collected quite a few poems from islanders who've made their submissions as well as off-islanders, because we're also doing a seasonal Martha's Vineyard Poet Laureate. So it embraces those who aren't with us in the summer. We don't want to discriminate as poets. You know? <laughs> and there are some fine poets uh, who are here seasonally, believe me. Um, so if you want, you can pick up a copy of the contest and you get an understanding as to how we are producing the contest and the announcement will be made late July, early August. And here's a character perhaps all of you have seen at one time or another. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this is the Civil War statue in Oak Bluffs looking out over the ocean. Uh, it was emplaced in 1861 and on the back of this paper, you'll see the history of this statue to take home. So you can tell your friends when, you, when they're visiting and you're driving through Oak Bluffs, you can show them what you know as an islander. <laughs> <laughs> and he's made 100% of zinc, by the way. And he was bought from a catalog. <laughs> it, 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 the, so that you can buy these as ornaments in your yard. It, it was the Union soldier. Um, you could put him in your garden because <laughs> it was a garden catalog by Fisk. <laughs> and uh, it's remarkably well done for a casting. It's beautiful, as a matter of fact. And um, there is another one in existence, and we are fortunate there is, because not all of them have survived to today, because a couple of times when we were repairing this statue, we had to go to another one that is being maintained by another town, and uh, I'll see here. Well, you'll read it on the back of this sheet that I wrote up, but we went, um, to the other statue and made castings of parts so that we could keep this one true to the original. <clears throat> now, how did the Civil War impact Martha's Vineyard? Well, you heard from Ellie. Um, our Martha's Vineyard Museum is doing a great exhibit, which I visited a couple of times. It's very impressive, and it's just like scratching the surface. And uh, we have John Huff coming, as Betty Burton just explained. So um, here we have a book by one of the island's better writers. But also, too, it impacted the island and the entire country. Well, at that time, the states um, that composed the United States. Uh, it was the first time in our history that a federal tax came into existence. And this is unknown to practically everyone that I've spoken with, because we wonder where our federal taxes, that the levy taxes, where it came from. Well, it came from the uh, Civil War, and I'll read you a statement that was published on February 14th, 1862, when we were engaged in the war. We shall soon have from Congress the bill on taxation, and each person will have an opportunity, <laughs> I love that word, an opportunity of knowing <laughs> how much will, will be required of him to aid the country in its present war with rebellion. Of course, various opinions will be expressed as to the apportionment of the taxes, and legislators must not be expected to satisfy everybody, incomes, domestic spirits, tobacco, newspapers, 
and paper, railroad passengers, poll tax, et cetera, et cetera, are suggested as some of the things from which money may be obtained to make up the amount of $150 million annually. This is not a very agreeable subject <laughs> of contemplation to a people unaccustomed to national taxes, but we believe that so popular and necessary a war, making it appeal to the passionate love of country so prevalent, will prevent any very extensive grumbling at a measure so indispensable. Our Army and Navy have been so inconsiderable heretofore that our expenses on this account have been very inconsiderable. We are now being taught the blessings of peace by tasting the bitterness of war, and we apprehend that both sections of the country, North and South, when we come together again, as we no doubt shall, for there is a necessity for it all, will be content to let each other alone on geographical questions of tariff and slavery for some time to come. So that was the beginning of the first federal tax in the history of the United States, and it lives with us today. <clears throat> now, Herman Melville, who has roots here on Martha's Vineyard, in his books and references, like Moby Dick, he refers to Tattoo, the Aquina Indian. And he also sailed with the whale ships that were captained and owned by islanders here on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. So deep in his soul, Melville had this connection to the sea, to the island here on Martha's Vineyard, but also in this, into the Civil War. Because the island of Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, when it came time to fulfill their conscription, the call to service, most of the people who volunteered, volunteered for the Navy from Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. There's one caveat with that, however, and that is that Martha's Vineyard, nor Nantucket or Massachusetts received credit for having a volunteer come from this area of the United States. Uh, when it came to conscription, each state had to provide so many warriors. And uh, Massachusetts, um, was one of the worst states in the North when it came to providing warriors. And uh, Islanders here really did not want to go, many of them. Uh, we had uh, newspaper ads by a fellow by the name of Norton paying $50 for every Islander who would sign up. Um, we would go off island and uh, find someone who was interested in signing up and bring them to the island so that it would count as a vineyarder. So, so one less vineyarder would be involved in the war. Um, and just like in Vietnam, we had people from the north going up into Canada. And uh, in 1863, a bill was introduced into the Canadian Parliament providing for a return to the United States of all deserters from our army. And by the new conscription law, every man whose name is drawn and who fails to appear would be called a deserter, and when caught, will be punished as being one, which means probably put to death. <clears throat> so that, it was very serious back then. And Melville, a favorite of mine, I just love his writing. Uh, he wrote a couple of beautiful poems. Um, he did have family involved in the Civil War. He did go out and witness battles. Um, he was out there with the troops on some of the battles, which he wrote about. 
Uh, and um, he is perhaps one of the most renowned Civil War poets. And his ver first book of poetry was completely based on the Civil War. And by the way, it created a new genre of writing and form, which if you explore Melville and um, the, how they diagnosed the writings that came out of the Civil War, it was a new genre. It was different than what we were used to in America. But anyhow, he loved um, to, uh, in a romantic fashion, write to, in his novels. But when it came to the war, his style changed um, to being um, somewhat caustic, somewhat realistic, somewhat sobering. Um, perhaps uh, his use of words uh, was cacophonous. Um, he didn't um, have his rhymes being so smooth as they were in his prose. But he did write of the battles, and um, he wrote of the Battle of the Monitor and the Merrimack, you know, the ironclads. But he also wrote this poem, which I found um, to be most profound because it involved the sinking of ships, whaling ships, to block a harbor. And a lot of the whaling ships from Martha's Vineyard were attacked on the high seas as they were out there gathering whale oil. So we were fair game. <clears throat> the title of this poem by Herman Melville. It's called The Stone Fleet, An Old Sailor's Lament. And you can feel his connection. It was written in December 1861. We were about um, April, May, June, July, August, September, September, about eight months into the war. <clears throat> I have a feeling for those ships, each worn and ancient one, with great bluff bows and broad in the beam. I was unkindly done, but so they serve the obsolete. Even so, stone fleet. You'll say, I'm doting. Do but think. I scudded around the horn in one. The tornadoes, a glorious, good old craft, as ever run, sunk, how all on meet with the old stone fleet. An India ship of fame was she, spices and shawls and fans she bore, a whaler when her wrinkles came, turned off till spent and poor, her bones were sold a sheet. Ah, stone fleet. Four were erst patrician keels. Names attest what families be. The Kensington and Richmond too, Leonidas and Lee, but now they have their seat with the stone fleet. To scuttle them, a pirate deed, sack them and demast. They sunk so slow, they died so hard, but gurgling dropped at last. Their ghosts and gales repeat, woes us, stone fleet. And all for naught, the waters pass, currents will have their way. Nature is nobody's ally. Tis well, the harbor is bettered, we'll stay. A failure and complete was your old stone fleet. So the um, ships that were sunk, 15 ships to block the harbor, failed to block the harbor. So following me, Lee. Thank you. I have to add to William's uh, comments on Melville that one of the greatest stories about Melville I ever read was a little brief paragraph of history that stated Mrs. Melville was entertaining 
one of her neighbors, another woman, and she said, oh, what is Herman doing? And Mrs. Melville looked at her and said, please don't tell anybody Herman's writing poetry. <laughs> That's where poetry was at in those days. <laughs> so, well, back to the Civil War. <laughs> um, it's nice to hear all this history because I've read a lot of this history, but I don't retain a lot of it and I have to go back and remind myself, or I have to read or hear about it. But there, there are certain things that stuck out to me in, in reading about the Civil War and learning about it. And, you know, I mean, just the sheer insanity of the brutality of it. If you can imagine the brutality of the weapons, the brutality of the medical services, you know, it's a wonder that anybody survived at all. And <clears throat> so many, you know, so many died just in stupid, stupid ways because of the way these commanders thought about battles and, and the way they handled it, you know. But um, I also think a lot about the, the effects on people in general and on soldiers and, you know, because they are, they're human beings. You have, to, you have to accept every soldier as a human being, even if he's a psychopath. And believe me, there are a lot of those these days. So um, this is a poem about Andersonville Prison, which was one of the grimmer parts of the Civil War. Um, it was written by a man named William Comfort who was the 35th New Jersey Volunteers, and he wrote this poem in 1864 while he was in Andersonville Prison. And it's pretty stark in a way. It's very well written, but it's, it's a very sad poem in a way because it's really, really filled with a lot of the tragedy and despair of that whole situation. It was a prison for Union soldiers <coughs> run by the Southern, and it was, the conditions were absolutely un, unhuman. It was just horrible. The commander of Andersonville was a sadist and probably a psychopath, and he didn't care. And he basically, they treated the Union prisoners like they were scum and just something that could, you know, they weren't fed properly, they had no medication, they had no housing. They had to sleep in mud and slime and filth, you know, human, human waste. They had no, no facilities of any kind, disease was rampant, they would kill them. You know, if, if, if they got sick, they'd just shoot them, rather than give them medical aid, you know. And that's not to say that it didn't happen on the other side too, but Andersonville is just very famous and very notorious for this. Um, a cry from Andersonville Prison is what is called by William Comfort. When our country called for men, we came from forge and hill, from workshop, farm and factory, the broken ranks to fill. We left our quiet, happy home and those we love so well to vanquish all our union foes or fall where others fell. Did I just do this backwards? Vanquish all our union folks. Was Andersonville a union prison? No, no. It was, it was a southern union prison, union wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was in the south. Yeah. Huh? It was in the south. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I... Well, I mean, you know, he does a little trippy thing here where he just said to vanquish all our union foes or fall where others fell. Okay. But now in prison drear we languish and tis our constant cry. O ye who can yet save us, will you leave us here to die? Did the voice of slander tell you that our hearts were weak with fear, that all or nearly all of us were captured in the rear? But the scars upon our bodies from the musket ball and shell, the missing legs and shattered arms, a truer tale will tell. We have tried to do our duty in the sight of God on high, and ye who can yet save us, now leave us here to die. 
There are hearts with hope still beating in our northern homes, watching, waiting for the footsteps that will never come. In southern prisons, pining, meager, tattered, pale and gaunt, growing weaker, weaker daily from pinching cold and want, are husbands, sons, and brothers who hopeless captives lie. And ye who yet can save us, will you leave us here to die? From out of our prison gate, there's a graveyard close at hand, where lay 14,000 Union men beneath a southern sand, and scores are laid beside them as day succeeds each day, and thus it shall be we all shall pass away. And the last can say while dying with upturned glazing eye, both faith and love are dead at home, and they've left us here to die. That's pretty sad. Um, Is that a survivor of the prison? Mm-hmm. Yeah, William Comfort. Well, he wrote that in prison. in prison. I don't know if he survived. Although I suspect, yeah, I don't, I, I'll tell you the truth. I don't know. I'll have to find out. Because he wrote some other things, too. Um, and getting into the reality of the human toll or the human humanity that was there in spite of the war. I'll just finish with these two things quickly. This is called Battled Christian Kittens. And in true uh, spirit of poetry, it's a prose piece, which I shall call a poem. The hell with that guy. Philly, what's his name? What's his, what's his name? <laughs> okay. Battle Christian Kitchen Kittens. Battle Christian Kittens. On the morning of the 8th of April, 1861, just after the battle, Corporal Ed H. of Company B, Illinois, came running to me with three playful little kittens under his arm, peeping maliciously out of his haversack. Why, H., what in the name of all this wonderful did you come across these kittens? Found them. Ain't they beauties, though? I say, Captain, you can have one if you'll promise to take real good care of it. Kittens, kittens on the field of Shiloh. Why, exclaimed a sergeant at my elbow, I thought that every living thing in the shape of bird, beast, and insect was either killed by the iron hail or the thunder. Why, they're as natural as life. If you've no objection, I'll take one, H. Instantly, a score of eager hands were outstretched towards the demure kitties. Found him in a house over there, said H, nodding towards a deserted cabin. Old pussy's gone off and left him. Never mind, we'll take care of him. And well they did, to see the men who the day before breathed nothing but dire vengeance and slaughter, nursing and feeding those motherless kittens, would have effectively dissipated any doubts the observer Oops might have entertained any doubts the observer might have entertained concerning their genuine tenderness and sympathy. Soldiers are immensely fond of pets. Those kittens were carried on knapsacks hundreds of miles, and when the black coffee was gulped down without a murmur, Kitty would rub her paws and yawn contentedly over the cup from which she had just licked the last vestige of milk. That surprised me when I found that one being written by a soldier. Well, the last thing I'm going to read real quickly is just another poem about the end of the war and homecoming. And this is called, uh, and this is by a woman too, which is interesting because uh, a woman named Kate Putnam Osgood who was writing poems during the Civil War. This is called Driving Home the Cows. Out of the clover and blue-eyed grass, he turned them into the river lane. One after another, he let them pass, then fastened the meadow bars again. Under the willows and over the hill, he patiently followed the sober pace. The merry whistle for once was still, and something shadowed the sunny face. Only a boy, and his father said he could never let his youngest go. Two already were lying dead under the feet of the trampling foe. 
But after the evening work was done and the frogs were loud in the meadow swamp, over his shoulder he slung his gun and steadily followed the footpath damp. Across the clover and through the wheat, with resolute heart and purpose grim, though cold was the dew on his hurrying feet, and the blind bat's flitting startled him. There it is. Thrice since then had the lanes been white and the orchards sweet with apple bloom. And now, when the cow cows came back at night, the feeble father drove them home. For news had come to the lonely farm that three were laying where two had lain. And the old man's tremulous, palsied arm could never lean on a son's again. The summer day grew cool and late. He went of the cows when the work was done. But down the lane as he opened the gate, he saw them coming one by one. Brindle, Ebony, Speckle, and Bess, shaking their horns in the evening wind, cropping the buttercups out of the grass. But who was it who followed close behind? Loosely swung in the idle air the empty sleeve of army blue, and worn and pale from the crisping hair, looked out of a face that the father knew. For southern prisons will sometimes yawn and yield their dead unto life again. And the day that comes with a cloudy dawn in golden glory may at last wane. The great tears sprang to their meeting eyes, for the heart must speak when lips are dumb. And under the silent evening skies together they follow the cattle home. Okay, uh, this journal entry is uh, dated Richmond, Virginia, April 19th, 1865, and, and it is from uh, Charlie Mack. I seat myself this uh, pleasant day, at the clo uh, this pleasant evening at the close of a very sorrowful day, yet one that will long be remembered in, the, in my loyal heart of the, to the United States as the funeral day of our much beloved President Lincoln. The memory of Abraham Lincoln will be cherished tenderly for future de generations as the savior of our country. country. Under the guidance um, of his name, we will always be associated, it will always be associated with that of Washington. Each hour but increases my hatred for secession and all connected with it, and I would fain wreck the di direst vengeance upon the infernal traitors, yes, traitors to God and their country, that would have sought to trample underfoot everything that tended to enlighten and benefit the world, and have at last stricken down our noble president, the hope of our nation, and the hope of liberty loving but downtrodden people of the old world. A feeling of universal um, execration mingled with poignant sorrow pervades our army. They would fight now with more zest than ever, and I fear the contest would be a bloody one for Uncle Abe, as he was familiarly termed in the army. Um, he has many warm friends among the soldiers, and his loss is deeply regretted. Had we the um, perpetrator of this assassination, I think judgment would be at fault, humanity be forgotten, and worse torture imaginable inflicted upon him. No event of the war ever served to exasperate the soldiers um, so much. Today I visited the soldiers' burial ground at Oak Grove, only a short distance from our camp. 
It is quite a pleasant spot, yet within the space of about 40 acres lie the remains of 38,000 soldiers, 30,000 Confederates, and 8,000 Union men. Think of this, one burial ground, and then think of the havoc of war. Many are buried in trenches, piled on top of one another. I saw some Negroes working there who said they had worked ever since the war began, digging graves, and they were digging today for more victims. It was a horrid place, but yet the work was a little more decently done than if they had perished on the battlefield. Near our camp on the bank of the river is the great um, is the grave of Powhatan, the great Indian chieftain, the father of Pocahontas, who saved the life of Captain um, Smith. And so he goes on and he, and he talks about that. But I think his, uh, here, you know, he's, he's thinking about our past history. He's here in this place. And um, he's just kind of like questioning the whole, the whole meaning of what, what, what this is all about and the fact that Negroes are burying both Confederates and Union, you know. I, and so I, I think um, that, you know, that, that little excerpt there just kind of said that war crosses all boundaries and all ethnicity, you know, and, and even in our own country. So um, anyway, I do invite you to take a copy of that newspaper that has been published uh, by the Gazette, and there are excerpts of Charlie Mack's diary in there, but, uh, but more so come and visit us and see um, what we have to offer our community. And what you have to offer us, thank you, Betty, so much, really, for having us and for being a partner in all this. Thank you. I must say that this evening of Civil War poetry has been, for me, most educational and entertaining. I again want to give thanks to Betty Burton uh, for setting up this evening through her grants with the National Endowment for the Humanities and with the American Library Association. And also, uh, Ellie, thank you for the participation of the Martha's Vineyard Museum. You know, it's events like this that the Martha's Vineyard Poetry Society was founded for approximately one year ago. And to that end, I was so glad to see the support of the community for this evening. And in closing, again, I started the night showing you about our soldier here this Civil War soldier that has been in Oak Bluff since 1891. And I wrote a poem for this soldier. 121 years, palpable vestige made manifest. Symbol of conflict, death, tears, healing waters, for all to ingest, dressed in blue, dressed in gray, six feet of zinc looks away to see, watching, waiting for coming day, our awakening world to harmony. And besides just being a statue, an icon representing the Civil War, at the base of this statue, and this is the way it was ordered when it was ordered from the catalog, and this was the way it was first set up at the bottom of Circuit Avenue in 1891. And if you look at the old photographs of Circuit Avenue, you'll see it was a dirt street. And there were places for horses to tie up, and it was a wagon road because horses with wagons would go up and down Circuit Avenue. But at the base, of this statue, there are two huge troughs for supplying water to the horses and also for people to drink from. There's a fountain. And then at the base, most remarkably, there are also two smaller troughs, 
way down at the base for dogs to drink and cats. So it, uh, it, when you're talking about healing and water being a part of healing, uh, in the design of this statue, when it was this monument, that it, it uh, was well thought out to be all-inclusive. And just a few more notes on this Civil War soldier. Um, at the statue's dedication in 1891, Strahan, Charles Strahan, he was the fellow that uh, donated this statue to the community. His five-year-old daughter Louise had the honor of removing the American flag covering the Union soldier. Now this soldier, he was painted to represent a Union soldier. But later on, because of the hardship that Strahan went through, Strahan was from Virginia, and he served in the Confederate Army. So when he came to Martha's Vineyard with his wife that he met in New York, they were rejected by the community of Martha's Vineyard because there were still the hard feelings from the Civil War in 1891. And he found that when he went to attend some of the veterans' meetings in town, that he was rejected. In fact, he was asked not to attend. But what he did do was very astute. He bought the newspaper. Was, and he changed the name. It was called the Cottage City Star. It was a rather defunct newspaper. Well, he bought this newspaper and renamed it the Martha's Vineyard Herald. And he turned it from a seasonal publication at the camp meeting ground in Cottage City to a year-round publication. And before long, his newspaper eclipsed the sales of the Vineyard Gazette which was the long-established newspaper on Martha's Vineyard. So through his newspaper, um, he proposed to raise the monies for this Union statue. Uh, he found a softening in the Union veterans here on Martha's Vineyard and the community of Martha's Vineyard. And they donated the money so that he could bring the statue to Martha's Vineyard. And as fate would deliver, um, and also, too, I'll read you a passage um, when his daughter removed the flag from the statue. This is the quote from Charles Strahan. We are once more a union of Americans, a union of which endears with equal honor the citizen of Georgia with the citizen of Maine. That Massachusetts and South Carolina are again brothers and that there is no north, no south, no east, nor west, but one undividable, indivisible union. In 1980, the Oak Bluff City Council had the statue repainted to the colors of Confederate gray to honor the memory of Charles Strahan. And in August of 2001, when the statue was restored, six descendants of Charles Strahan traveled from Maryland to Martha's Vineyard to attend the rededication ceremony of the statue that their great-grandfather had installed. So, in closing, I want to thank you for sharing tonight. And again, thank you to the Vineyard Haven Library and the community of Martha's Vineyard for making this reality. And we look forward to Martha's Vineyard Poetry Society. Looks forward to bringing you other events like this. We have some big events planned for this summer, which you'll be hearing about through the media and our emails. So thank you, and thank you so much for coming tonight. And thank you again to the Vineyard Haven Library. Good night.